it's Jeff. Uh, back with you f with a contest entry video. I've been uh, meaning to make this video for a while now and I keep forgetting. So I'm going to do it right now. It's uh, <clears throat> the uh, This is my entry for uh, the great Bobby Z's uh, contest that he's doing for Christmas called The Lottery. And um, I'm one of the volunteers for this contest, which is where uh, he got, I think he got around 30 volunteers or so to each send the winner of the contest, whoever it is, uh, something for Christmas, <laughs> basically. A record, something music related, you know, the, it wasn't just limited to, you know, a CD or a record or a tape or whatever, but... Um, he assigned everyone a letter of the alphabet. I got the letter Z, which is pretty cool, I think. I've got a couple of ideas for things to send to the prospective winner. And um, I figured I'd enter the contest too and take my chances. So the theme of the contest is uh, it's called like the three ghosts where you would pick three musicians that have passed on and you would invite them to a Christmas dinner party. So um, I've watched a couple of other entries. One of my picks I think coincides with the vinyl verses and you'll see. But uh, for me to, to decide who I would really like to meet and or talk to at this Christmas party. Uh, in order to narrow that down, I basically picked the three musicians that made me the most sad when I heard of their passing. You know, every year as the years go by, more and more of these classic rock artists, you know, from the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s now, because that's already 30 years gone, are slowly dying off. You know, and you hear of this one and that one, and you're like, oh, wow, that's a shame. But it doesn't really affect you that deeply. But these three that I'm going to show you, I was genuinely sad that they had gone. It's not that, obviously, not because they were close personal friends, but just because their music and their, you know, their style, their look, their attitude towards life, you know, besides their music and their art, really, you know, meant a lot more to me than just your average singer or guitarist or musician. <clears throat> so that was the criteria I used. Let's get a little coffee in here. That was the criteria I used to make my, my choices. Now, if you guys know anything about me, and you've watched my videos for a while, my first choice is going to be no surprise to you. So, and I, I've picked three albums just to show them, just to have something to show. Uh, my first one would be David Bowie. Um, <clears throat> yeah, when, when I heard that uh, he died like two days after the Black Star album came out, or two days before the Black Star album came out, which was his final album, obviously. Um, I was really, really sad. I was really bummed because I had been slowly tracking down his albums I that I'd lost. And um, I'd been a fan of his music for so long. And it's just one of those things where, you know, you, you get hit with that the finality of it all, you know, it's like we're never going to get another record from this guy. We're never going to get another album. He's, he's never going to um, point the way for us, basically, because, you know, Bowie it was one of those guys. He was like a trailblazer. You know, he <clears throat> helped uh, start up the whole glam rock thing with Ziggy. You know, he had he, he had these he developed these characters besides just songs and albums you know he had the thin white duke which is my personal favorite that mid-70s era with station to station and low and this album here heroes and 
you know, and even in, into the 80s, you know, when he made his big commercial album. But he did it his own way, you know, and he had a monster hit with it, which I was happy for. But um, he was just one of those guys that you never you, you never think they're gonna they're gonna go <laughs> so uh <clears throat> yeah I, I played black star when i i pre or i pre-ordered it so it, it arrived you know right after the news of his passing and it was probably one of the saddest experiences i've had you know for with listening to an album for the first time so and i'm, I'm that's not dissing the album it's a great album and it would have been a great comeback for him between that one and, and the one he put out the year before called The Next Day, which used this cover but covered his face up with a big white square, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool too. You know, recycling his own album artwork photog or picture and, and doing something different with it. You know, because that was another thing. Boy was an artist. I mean, he wasn't just a musician. He had a... I guess he'd had a very massive art collection. He was a keen collector of it. And <clears throat> there were many facets to him besides just music. You know, there was fashion. There was art. He was an actor. He was in movies and plays. You know, he kind of he did it all, but he was able to do it all well. So I think it would, be, it would have been a massively interesting to have him come to my Christmas party because I think he would be just a massively interesting person to talk to, you know, just person to person. So uh, this would be my first um, ghost, if you will, for my Christmas party, uh, David Bowie. <laughs> for sure, David Bowie. That was, and when I first learned about this um, contest, that was the first person that I immediately thought of that I knew was going to be in it. <clears throat> uh, the second ghost was another, um, all three of these guys are British, so there's a little clue for you. My second one is going to be Joe Strummer, and there he is right there. And this is from The Clashes, their first album. Probably one of the greatest debut albums ever, in my opinion. And um, Joe Strummer died um, around Christmas time in 2002. And again, he had just put out a solo record right around the time that he died and again it just hit me hard you know I <clears throat> I'd always admired the clash they were one of those bands that you know had principles and had like they um, they weren't afraid to wear their politics on their sleeve they weren't afraid to you know, say what they wanted to say. Of course, and the way they said it was great through music. You know, there's many, many classic songs by The Clash. And um, Joe Strummer always struck me as one of those guys who would just never back down, you know. He, he wasn't afraid of anything, you know, in, in terms of expressing himself or in terms of backlash like you probably would get today. My stupid neighbor is going to fire up his leaf blower, and it's soaking wet outside. All right, I'm going to try and wrap this up quick. <laughs> um, back to Joe Strummer. When I heard he died, like I said, it just affected me greatly. You know, and, and even when I got back into vinyl, you know, the Clash albums were among the first um, bands that I wanted to get all of their albums up on vinyl, which wasn't that difficult. They, they don't have that many, so that made it a little easier, but... Uh, the Clash was one of those bands that, quote unquote, never sold out. And it wasn't until after Joe Strummer died that you saw a Clash song used for commercials. You know, like it, that was like the, the the hip thing that a lot of artists did to, uh, I guess, make some money for themselves is to just sell off the rights to their songs for use in commercials and the clash never did that until after joe died then all of a sudden you saw you know jaguar commercials using london calling i think was the song and there have been some other clash songs that have been in commercials too which really kind of pisses me off but while he was alive i know 
Joe would never have allowed that. So that just hits me the right way. I don't know anywhere else to say it. <laughs> but um, I think he would be another super interesting guy to talk to, not only about rock and, and punk, but about anything. So uh, Joe Strummer would be my second uh, ghost that I would invite to my Christmas party. And the third one <clears throat> is, uh, I was very sad, but I was also very, very young when I heard of John Lennon passing when he got shot in 1980. I was only like 10 years old and I didn't really know who he was and I didn't really know too much about the Beatles or music or anything. So when George Harrison died in 2001, I think, 2001, again, around this time of year, I think it was in November, uh, it hit me a lot harder, you know, because, and uh, I mentioned this, I, I commented on Jeff Party's video. He just did a video yesterday that I watched about his 10 favorite uh, George Harrison Beatles songs, which you should check out. It's a good video. And um, I said in my comment that during his Beatles career, George was the one you could really see grow the most. You know, he was kind of uh, tentative with, you know, songwriting. And like his early attempts are, you know, they're okay, but they're certainly nothing compared to Lennon and McCartney, you know. And, and the level of competition that I sure, I'm sure he must have undergone when they were making Beatles albums to get some of his songs on the albums w was extraordinarily difficult because Lennon and McCartney are just geniuses when it comes to songwriting. But over time, uh, George Harrison grew, and I would say by, by the end, unfortunately, of their career as the Beatles, he was easily on par with the songs that Lennon and McCartney were putting out. And then, of course, by the time this album came out, All Things Must Pass... He had so many songs in his backlog that it just kind of exploded out of him. <laughs> so that's why this uh, album, it's a triple album, but um, the third disc, I think, is just a jam session that he did. But for the actual songs that he recorded for this album proper, it's fantastic. It's one of the best double albums or triple albums ever. And this is easily my favorite solo Beatles album. Easily. And... Uh, I just love the sound of this thing. I love, you know, that he had Phil Spector as his producer, but I guess Phil Spector was out of his mind on drugs, and so we don't really know exactly how much of a contribution he gave. But you can tell that the sound on it is just so big, and so, you know, he was just putting it all out there. <sighs> Coming out from under the shadow of, like I said, Lennon and McCartney. And it, it always seemed like, out of all of the solo Beatles, George was the one who just, he seemed like he would be the nicest guy. You know, I've, I've watched um, the documentary that Martin Scorsese did on, on George called Living in the Material World. And uh, it's a good movie, it's a good documentary. If you've never seen it, I think it's still on Netflix. You can catch that pretty easily. I would say watch it. It's really good. And you kind of get a different sense of George as a person. And um, I was super thrilled when he made his comeback in the late 80s with his uh, partnership with Jeff Lynne, you know, who produced uh, Cloud Nine, which was an album that George put out. He put him back on the map, so to speak. And then he did his stuff with the Traveling Wilburys, which I thought was amazing. And um, <clears throat> it just seemed like of all the people, to, it just seemed like it, it just made the no sense to have George die. I mean, it never it never makes sense for anyone to die, really. But um, it just seemed like he just had so much to give. He was such a giving person, from what I've heard and read and, and watched about him. So, and of course, I I like his singing voice. He's, he was a great singer. He's a fantastic guitarist. You know, he's a great musician. And it seems like he never really wanted to embrace or deal with the trappings of being a Beatle, you know? It's like, that was just something that he did in the past. He just wants to leave it in the past. He didn't really 
use that so much for his own purpose, I think, beyond being able to put out albums. <clears throat> so I also think this would be a super interesting person to have along with Joe and David at a Christmas party to have them all together just to get his views on religion. You know, he went through a big trans, uh, transition in his religious philosophy, which came out in his music. Um, but he still remained, you know, a rock artist. He didn't become like a Christian rock artist. It was just part of him, you know? You don't really get that anymore these days. It's like if you were to put out a, a religious song now, it would get tagged, you know, it would be like Christian rock or something or just Christian music. But it wasn't so with George because... You know, I don't think you can make a song I don't, like My Sweet Lord these days where you're singing Hallelujah as the chorus and then Hare Krishna. It just doesn't seem like that could fly these days the way it could back in the 70s. So, um, yeah, I, I would love to sit down with George and just to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee with him and just listen to him, you know. Whatever he had to say, I would just gladly listen. Same with the other two guys. Which is the reason why they made my list for the entry into this contest. So, George Harrison was my third pick. <clears throat> and uh, the last part of the contest is you have to pick a charity uh, for or whoever wins. The, the, the other contestants, the other volunteers will donate to that charity. So, as uh, my charity, I'm picking the American Cancer Society um, for obvious reasons. I mean, well, not so obvious because I don't really talk about that. But um, I have to say that there have been just too many people that I've lost in my life due to cancer. You know, George died of cancer. David Bowie died of cancer. Um, my wife had thyroid cancer. She had to have her thyroid removed. You know, it was like one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. And I'm I'm going to be open and honest with you guys, so don't bash me. One of the most terrifying experiences of my life was uh, coming into the uh, post-op room right after her surgery when she was coming out of anesthesia because she'd had to have her thyroid removed because it was loaded with tumors. And it was, it was, you could see this bulge on her neck and it was making, actually, pushing on her esophagus, making it hard for her to breathe. And uh, her thyroid had to be completely removed, but they cut her literally almost from ear to ear. It's, it started like back here and it went all the way down here, all the way down to here. And that was easily the most terrifying experience I think I've ever had. <clears throat> uh, so... And then uh, my wife's cousin had a double mastectomy. My wife's best friend had a double mastectomy. Um, it just seemed like two or three years ago when she had her surgery, everybody we knew had something to, to deal with cancer. And it's just, pardon my French, it's just a motherfucker. So my, uh, my charity, should I win, is the American Cancer Society. Because there's got to be some way to stop it. There's got to be. And if anyone's going to do it, hopefully it's going to be them. So, uh, yeah, that's my pick. So, that's going to be it for my entry. I'm going to try to get this done in less than 20 minutes. I'm closing in on the end here. So, um, good luck to everyone else that's in the contest. I won't crap out with the gift. If I don't win, that's not an issue. You can count on me, Bobby. I got you. So um, everyone else take care. Peace, everyone. Merry Christmas, and uh, I'll be back soon. Take care.